Yo, 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 welcome to Hard Pass. I am your host, Jacques Slade. Today on the show, we've got a pair of transcendent stars saying goodbye, a special request for Ye, and the week's hottest releases. Of course, we have Hard Pass as well. All right, let's start with some hot takes. Lloyd Banks is not happy with how the perception of the Black Air Force Ones has changed over the years. So they turned the Black Air Force One to the Black Nazis, right? Come on. We wanted to talk to you about this. Are you upset by that? <laughs> yeah, I'm upset by black that. Clothes, <laughs> black clothes with your black forces. I'm upset. Forces. I'm upset. The Black Nasties. Wait, was that your signature shoe back in the day? Yeah, I wore them, and they didn't show the crease as fast as the white. Meanwhile, co-writer is not happy with Banks' performance in 50 Cent, Blood on the Sand, the seminal Gears of War knockoff from 2009. See, co-writer has been playing the Japanese PS3 version of the game because it's the only one that has trophies, and he's disappointed in Banks and DJ Who Kid. Tony Yayo is out here stealing the show with epic one-liners and trash talk while Banks and Who Kid can't be bothered to even try. So the feeling is mutual, Banks. We're all unhappy. Oh, and pro tip, if you want to try and get the Platinum 50 Cent Blood on the Sand trophy, you can't. Several trophies require you to play online co-op, but those servers were shut down years ago. If you know people who run secret Blood on the Sand servers so dorks like Co-Rider and I can get this precious Platinum, just let us know. And that was probably the nerdiest thing you'll ever hear on this show. Dragon Ball character Piccolo has been having a renaissance of sorts these past few weeks. Maybe it's in anticipation of his big role in the upcoming US release of the movie Dragon Ball Super Superhero, a memoir by Jordan Calhoun titled Piccolo is Back that dealt with his experience of assigning race to animated characters and pictures of a hot dunk custom. But Gohan's real dad has been getting all of the flowers. He really is the dad that stepped up. A uh, guy who thinks he's smarter than he really is, Aaron Rodgers, doesn't feel the need to play in the preseason. Cool, I don't feel the need to hear him talk and actually, that's the whole bit. Man, it's like a two horse race between him and Kanye for who we've turned on the most since we started this show. Ah well, the hard pass cancel coffin does come with NFL MVPs and headlines that they're worth a billion dollars, so I'm sure they'll be fine with us talking a little shit. The WWE is now firmly in the Triple H era. And there's a quirk in the current storyline that has me thinking about Bronny James. Look, let me explain. So Rey Mysterio is feuding with a faction called Judgment Day. I could get into the minutia of that whole thing and how badly they botched the plot, but it's not worth it. Except for one thing, the continued dominance of Rhea Ripley against Rey's son, Dominic. It has emboldened a segment of Ripley's fan base to, uh, let's say great pleasure in watching her beat the crap out of Dom. And wishing it was them who were taking said beatings. It's weird. I mean, look at this gif and it'll all make sense. And if that weren't enough, Rhea is super aware of this and has now taken to calling herself Dom's Poppy. The use of Poppy is highly specific because there was a whole storyline from 2005 where Ray isn't actually Dom's father and no, no, we're not gonna do this co-writer, but shout out to late Eddie Guerrero. Anyways, Rey Mysterio is a legend, one of the true goats of pro wrestling. He can still perform at a high level and on any given night, he can be as good as he once was in the 90s and 2000s. But you also get the feeling that the main reason he's still going is because he wants to be there for Dom. Now, I'm not saying the main reason LeBron is still going is because he wants to be there for Bronny, but what I am saying is that when Bronny gets to the NBA, everybody is going to try to wreck him like Rhea is wrecking Dom. Except for the whole horny part. If you thought the abuse Austin Rivers caught when he was playing for the Clippers was bad, imagine what's going to happen every time Bronny is out there trying to check John Morant or Luka. You know that Steph is going to relish the moment he sees Bronny out there. Hell, if Chris Paul is still playing, you know he's going to try and snatch Bronny's soul to troll his banana boat buddy. Betting favorite on who would dare call themselves Bronny's poppy? Draymond? But I'm hoping Lance Stevenson can hang on for a few more years so he can have a moment. Just please don't let it be Pat Bev. So this week, we retreated to two monumental moments in the sports world. First up, Sue Bird played her final regular season home game for the Seattle Storm in front of a sold out crowd of 18,100. That's the largest crowd in not only Storm history, but the history of that building. But I wouldn't call it an outlier though, as the fans have packed the former home of the Sonics for a while now. Second, Serena Williams announced her, sorry, evolution away from the sport of tennis. She's stepping away to begin her journey to pursue her business ventures and add another member to her family with husband Alex Ohanian, aka co-founder of Reddit, and someone who probably outbid co-writer for several of Serena's best rookie cards. Not that he's bitter or anything. Anyways, Bird is getting her flowers after a long career where she was consistently on the upper echelon of WNBA stars, but she's also been getting a lot of love from her sneaker community fans for her commitment to, well, staying fresh. 
I'll admit to not really knowing what Sue rocked prior to her association with Kyrie Irving and his signature line, but a search through Getty Images has got me wondering when the hell is Nike going to bring back some of the heat in her early days? Like, give me a Nike Zoom Air Hirachi 2K4 and LeBron Zoom Soldiers in Seattle colors? Like, yesterday. We still have the WNBA playoffs, so there's a chance we could see Sue ride off to the sunset in Golden Kyrie's. So, fingers kind of crossed for that one. And as for Serena, well... There's really not a whole lot that can be said about her that hasn't already been said. I mean, no GOAT of tennis conversation is complete without her. In the open era, it's Serena, it's Steffi Graf, it's Roger Federer, it's Rafael Nadal, and it's Novak Djokovic, and it's a damn shame we never really got to see her shine in memorable Nike signature shoes. For a brief period in the mid-2000s, she did have a signature shoe in the Nike Shock SW, but raise your hand if you can even remember that was a thing. Anybody? No? We dedicated a segment to Serena's lack of a signature shoe early in Hard Pass's run, forgetting about those and forgetting that they even happened. Like, Nike Tennis really doesn't do proper signature shoes. It wasn't a situation unique to Serena, though. This goes all the way back to Andre Agassi and the Nike Tech Challenges. I mean, Nike would never call the upcoming Nike LeBron 20 the Nike Zoom Generation 20, so why does the court flare not have Serena's name or initials? It's a moot point now because Serena rocks the Zoom Vapor X, a shoe line that was once tied to Federer, but I guess I just wonder what could have been had they given Serena a real deal signature shoe to run with. Like Sue, Serena will have one more chance to electrify the crowd as the US Open looks to be her big send-off. I don't necessarily think that this is the final tournament Serena will play, but it's probably the last where she will have a realistic chance at winning Grand Slam number 24. Nike Tennis has rolled out a number of high-profile releases in past US Open, so here's hoping we get another one as we celebrate Serena's retirement. Sorry, evolution. Yeah, she's so good that we can't even joke about it, but watch Aaron Rodgers say some shit like that and we'd be canceling him so fast, he'll probably win a third straight MVP. All right, let's move on to the Heat Check, where we bring you everything that's dropping this week. We have the Froskate Nike SB Dunk High Pro on the 17th for 130, the Air Jordan 14 Ginger on the 17th for 210, the Reebok Question Blue Toe on the 18th for 160, Salehi Bimberry's Crocs Pollux Clog Cobbler on the 18th, and the Air Jordan 13th French Blue on the 19th for $200. Then the easy of the week is the Adidas Yeezy Boost 700 V2 Vanta, which is a restock. This will be on the 19th for $300. According to ScienceABC.com, Vanta is short for Vanta Black, which is a super black coating that is the darkest substance man has ever synthesized. It is made of densely packed carbon nanotubes that are aligned vertically along each other, and it absorbs almost 99.99% of light. It was originally developed for satellites to soak up the sun's shower of light to the last drop, but it has many other potential uses. And then the pick of the week is the Ambush Nike Air Just Force Summit White and Black and the Black and Psychic Purple on the 19th for 210 each. Okay, I had to check. If you Google image search Nike Air Just Force East Bay, one of the first results is the scanned page from an old catalog in 96 that features the classic hoop shoe for $125 plus $11.99 if you wanted a different colored removable strap. Like, there's a part of me that's really happy that these are coming back and the ambush cosign means Nike might have other plans for this comeback. But something about the price jumping that much in 26 years is something I have to get used to. It's not like we don't deal with this with Jordan Retros and Air Force Ones, but something about this increase caught me off guard, and that's not even taken into account when they are on sale at places like Sports Chalet, you know, where they took you to the limit and whatnot. And now for a heat check on, you know, actually, let's change things up a little bit here. So we have to once again talk about the ongoing drama between Kanye West and Adidas. Not because there's anything new that's developed since last week's declaration by Ye that Adidas made up Yeezy Day without his approval and released new colorways that he had no hand in. We here at Hard Pass would like to ask something of Ye. He's probably in the phase of not wanting to help Adidas at this point, but this is not about Adidas, but more about his fans. You see... Some of them are in crisis mode right now because these sneakers that they have been defending for years as works of genius, and that's genius spelled J-E-E-N-Y-U-H-S, now have imposters in their midst. If what Ye is saying is true, that means that there is now a clear line in the sand when it comes to Adidas Yeezys, colorways he's approved and colorways he did it. This is not unlike OG Air Jordan colorways versus ones that MJ never wore during his playing days. If you're a Ye fan and you buy a pair of Yeezys, you're going to want to know that Ye approved them, right? Yeah, 
There's gonna be people who don't care at all and just want a pair of Yeezys, but for the real fans, the one who justify his toxic because he wrote Jesus Walks nearly 20 years ago, they're gonna wanna know the level of involvement Ye had in something like the high-res blue Yeezy 700. Was that a moment of inspiration for Ye or the product of someone just messing around at the color lab at Adidas HQ? Ye, if you could just let us know which Yeezys have your blessing, that would help your stands out a lot. And I just wanna say thank you in advance. All right, it's time for this week's Hard Pass where we take a look at something in the culture that just needs to go. Like all this drama surrounding Live Golf, the Rebel Golf Tour that's being funded by legendary Masters choker Greg Norman and bankrolled by the Saudi Public Investment Fund may have just scored their biggest get yet as rumors are swirling that British Open winner and mullet aficionado Cameron Smith is on board. Smith is currently participating in the FedEx Cup, an end of the season series of tournaments that nets the overall points leader a fat check of 18 million. Considering that Smith's rumored deal with Liv includes a $143 million signing bonus, I'm surprised he's even trying to play in the FedEx. I mean, if I signed a $143 million deal where I can just coast off my name and play exhibition golf a dozen times a year, I'd take it easy. I wouldn't subject myself to press conferences where reporters ask me uncomfortable questions. And I definitely wouldn't snap at a fellow golfer who snitched on me before I had a chance to burn the bridge myself. I would take my clubs, my balls, and my integrity and go home and shut up while waiting for Greg to call. That way, I'll know what Trump golf course I have to be at in a few weeks to play 75% of a real tournament and team up with people I barely know and pretend to care about the sanctity and tradition of teams like Smash GC or Fireball GC. Can you guys smell the sarcasm? I hope, I hope you can smell it. Look. I'm not mad or upset that Smith or Brooks Kepka or Justin Johnson or Bryson DeChambeau are pissing away their legacy on the PGA Tour by joining Nick Faldo's favorite ragdoll, Greg Norman. Go do what you think is best for you. I just hope that you would be more honest with their intentions. This is not about growing the game or whatever line their PR people are telling them to say to reporters or fans. It's about the bag, period. Okay, they do care about winning. Kinda, but it's about the bag first. Then in a distant second, we've got the majors, the players championship, and a handful of tournaments like Riviera or Bay Hill or the Memorial. And there's nothing wrong with that. If you're in it for the money, just say you are. Because not a single one of these players would have jumped over if there wasn't a Scrooge McDuck size of money men waiting on the other side. Older players saw an opportunity to get one last payday instead of grinding out their final years on the tour, hoping to get a top 10 finish every few months. Current stars think they're Teflon and they can do whatever they want. And the college kids, well, they're probably calculating that even if Liv doesn't last more than a few years, they still have plenty of time to get back in the good graces of the PGA Tour. Just admit it's about the money instead of giving us boilerplate answers that they don't even believe and insulting the intelligence of the audience they're trying to court. And definitely don't try to double back and sue the tour to get into the FedEx Cup after leaving, which is what a trio of players tried to do. Any judge could see that those players left knowing they would make up the money that they would be losing and more by joining Liv. And that's exactly what happened. Just be more upfront like analyst David Faraday and admit the move to live was just a money grab. Personally, I'm not up in arms over the existence of the Live Tour. Even though I do agree with the sentiment that this is another example of sports washing, <clears throat> WWE and Saudi, <clears throat> sorry. Whew. Yes, Live Golf is sports washing, which are attempts by a government to wipe their hands of war crimes and egregious human rights violations by sponsoring events such as Live to promote themselves in a positive light. Charles Barkley, who considered a jump to Live before going back to TNT, was upset that people were critiquing his possible move when others do shady <laughs> all the time, including America. In a way, He's right, there's no such thing as ethical consumption in a capitalist society. He probably didn't say it in those words. I'm sure there was at a minimum three uh, first of alls and an unprovoked jab at Shaq, but he wasn't wrong to point out the hypocrisy. All of us are complicit in some way, whether it's buying sneakers or smartphones produced by laborers struggling in subhuman conditions or watching the NBA capitulate to China. But it's one thing to participate in it while actively trying to make it better, and it's another to basically be a mascot for it like Faraday has become, and Barkley would have been. I'm not saying I would support Liv if it was paid for by Americans like Jeff Bezos or Tiger Woods, but I'd probably have less of a problem leaving it on YouTube as background noise while I did other things. Now, as a golf fan, I don't care for Liv Golf for a number of reasons. The team concept is contrived, the 54-hole format is the equivalent of ending an NBA game after the third quarter, and having concerts after the tournament does nothing for fans who just want to watch the golf part. And no matter how hard Liv tries to sign away every top golfer, no defection will ever make me say, yeah, I can't watch the Masters because they banned Patrick Reed. That actually sounds like a positive, really. 
But what I do care about is what ideas the PGA Tour can take from Live Golf in order to make their product more appealing to a casual audience. Like refining the team aspect to make it more organic like an F1 or NASCAR and fixing the shotgun starts to make it easier to follow the players and keeping the broadcast under four hours. Because that's where this is all going at the end of the day. Live Golf will continue to exist and take players away from the PGA Tour for as long as the Saudis feel they are getting a return on their investment. And the PGA Tour will truck along promoting real golf competition while slowly adopting some of Liv's better ideas and handing out bigger paydays. All right. That's going to do it for the show. Thank you guys for watching Hard Pass. I am Jacques Slade. I'll see you next week. If you'd like to possibly be featured in a future episode, call us at 818-493-9325. Leave a short message, your social media if you want. No more than 30 seconds. All right. I'll see you next week. Peace. I, I, actually, wait. I uh, just had a thought. What if there was a live basketball? Like, what if the Saudi public investment fund teamed up with Ice Cube's Big Three and offered huge paydays for guys to leave the NBA? Who would be the first to sell out and why would it be Paul Pierce? Yeah. He would totally do it. All right. Peace for real.